This is Sound with Theater Live. Thanks for joining. I'm really excited for this episode. Ah, Lau, let go. Lau is in the booth with me. Um, she will be... Uh, I, I don't know what she's going to do for, for today. She kind of improvises whenever... Um, Oh man, look at that. Look at that stuff in my background there. That's just recycling. It's I'm not a hoarder, I promise. Um you can hear her breathing. She might harass me a little bit while I'm narrating, but that's okay. Um that'll just be for everyone's entertainment for sure. Um Thanks uh thanks so much for everybody coming. Uh let's see. Let me look at the comments. Okay, so cool. I can All right, I'm running StreamYard now instead of OBS. I think it's working. Can anybody uh, can anybody tell me one way or the other? Uh oh, stop it! No, okay. And um, yeah, let's let's get this started. Uh, Vault, Aaron Oster or Ari. If you hear uh, and you feel like jumping into the stream with me, let me know and I'll uh, I'll get you I'll get you started with us. Um, if not, cool. Just hang out in the chat while while I uh, while I narrate. So I have Rampage by Aaron Oster to to show off for you guys. And that one isn't published yet. This is a, a new piece that Aaron Oster is um, about to be releasing. I don't know, maybe this coming Friday. I can't remember exactly what day he said that was going to be happening. Um, uh oh, I'm getting uh, getting some. Some pings from Discord. Oh, come on. Eat this. Eat this. Come on. Get over here. Thank you. And uh, so, yeah, this is going to be a, a surprise. It's It's got that cool uh, leopard, blue leopard cover. Um, it's a little framey. Let me make sure. Let me see. Okay, I'm on my good. I'm on my good version of my internet so that shouldn't be the problem let's see if i can close some more tabs here i'll just close this one all together boom leave hopefully that'll help uh who else is is jumping to robot style man why is everything so difficult okay so who else is here besides sinful wound thanks for coming sinful wound Gary Simmons is here. Thanks for coming, Gary. Oh, the audio got better. Good. Uh, let's see here. I need to find. Ah, here we go. Olympus on Online is uh, hide the research. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Do I have research here? Is that happening? Um, okay, so also W. Bourne's Rich Bloss's, Rich Bloss's Olympus Online is also going to be read today. I think I'll do that first. What's up, Philip Hernandez? Good to see you. Uh, I think I'm going to do that one first. It, it's, uh, it, looks, it looks interesting. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've seen like a Greek, Greek mythology uh, lit RPG yet. So that's, that's bound to be entertaining. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to narrate that with a British accent because naturally um, that is what Greek people sound like. They have a British accent. So uh, don't you guys watch movies? And then um, very at the very end, I'm going to be super patriotic and I'm going to sing the Star Spangled Banner by Mr. Quantum Hughes or as Quantum Hughes. Yes, Quantum Hughes wrote the Star Spangled Banner, by the way, if you guys didn't know that. Quantum Hughes, of course, is the main character of the series The Feedback Loop by Harmon Cooper. Go buy it. It's the best. Um, yeah, and also, uh, so, let's see, yeah, I'll, I'll do Olympus Online. And remember, guys, if you want to check out, if you want to check out anything that I've read, anything that I'm narrating, if it seems interesting to you, I leave all the links to the stuff uh, in the description below. Actually, obviously, because Rampage 
isn't even out yet. I just left a link to all of Aaron Oster's um, other audiobooks. I think he's got he's already got five audiobooks. And uh, I've also left a link for the feedback loop on Audible. So anyway, here it goes. I'm going to go with Olympus Online first. Okay, Olympus Online, book one, Hero, chapter 14, Hydra. This scene takes place near the village of Delios. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Delios. And after a fight with some bandits and a priestess of Nyx, goddess of darkness and chaos, Jax is a barbarian fighter, and his companion, Toxidus, is a bow-wielding forest ranger. All right. So, oh, wait. Shadow Sun and the Game of Gods both reference Greek mythology, okay, but this is, like, all about, I mean, like, it's got a total hunky 300 cover. It looked like the guy had some tattoos, actually. Is that right? Did he have some tattoos? Which is kind of weird for, for Greek mythology, but whatever. All right, here goes. All British, British accents, because everyone knows that people who are Greek have British accents. Olympus Online, Book One Hero by W. Bourne. Chapter 14 Hydra. Two days later, Jax was starting to question his decision. It had seemed to be the right call, continuing their circuit of the village to clear out any monsters surrounding the village. To be honest, he hadn't really expected to see much and was just hoping for a pleasant few days of recovery, with perhaps the, the odd fight with some wolves or something. He had been mistaken. The first day, they had tangled with a pack of forest wolves and a giant snake. The wolves had included a matriarch, who was level nine, and a tough fight. Jax had been able to find a constricted area... Constricted area? Like he had with the wolf... Oh, Jax had been unable to find a constricted area like he had with the, with the wolf Alpha, so the fight dragged on for over two hours. Having Toxitus with him and had made a huge difference, as he was able to constantly draw the attention of the wolves away from Jax, allowing him to fight them one at a, one at a time. Toxitus had been severely drained by having, the kite, having to kite the wolves around, and had needed some time to recover. Towards the end of the day, Jax had literally stumbled upon the snake while searching for a good campsite. Before he knew it, coils of heavy, muscled snake had covered his lower body and began to squeeze. Only quick thinking by Jax, coupled with the quick availability of Berserk, had allowed him to attack and sever the snake using his sword. Toxitus had peppered the snake's head with arrows, and they had killed it pretty easily after that. Oh, that's that's a cool that's a cool little piece of trivia, Gary Sari Gimmons. Ah, uh, why is my nose itching? Both passed out a after a very blah, 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 blah. both passed out after a very long day, trusting that the area was fairly clear of predators due to the snake's presence. The next morning, they had awoken to a. Uh, I mean, this is a video game, right? So there's going to just be predators spawning everywhere all the time. The next morning, they had awoken to a pouring rain and were soaking wet. Almost immediately upon setting off after a cold and wet breakfast, they had stumbled into a pack of gorgons. Gorgons, Jax had discovered, snake-like creatures with the lower bodies of large snakes and the upper bodies of women. Ugly women. Their heads were covered, were covered with small hissing snakes, and they were all armed with bows. Caught by surprise, Jax had managed to kill one before they knew that Jax had Toxit and Toxitus were there. Hold on. Oh, itchy nose. Why? I bet it's my dog's fault for, like, being, jumping all over me today and spreading her fur across my existence. Toxitus had slain another in a duel at long range with arrows, while Jax had dodged arrows while trying to get the third one. In what must have been a god's favor of good fortune, he had managed to get his rage up enough to hit Berserk, which apparently made him immune to the Gorgon's ability to turn him to stone with their eyes. Jax still remembered the look of shock on the, la on the last Gorgon's face when her ability failed, and Jax's spear had taken her head off. Toxitus had just shaken his head, commenting, Lucky bastard. 
about another half day to the main road, Toxidus estimated, pausing to wipe the water from his eyes. He was particularly grubby due to the fact that he had, he had to carry his bowstring, bowstring wrapped in his pocket. He claimed he felt naked with his bow unstrung. Jax wasn't feeling much more cheerful after the Gorgon fight and slogging through the mud all day. His footwear, solid leather sandals, was not suited for mud. They sank in with every step due to his weight, and then the mud stayed in between the sandal and his foot, causing him to feel like he was going to slip at any moment. The rest of him, however, was fairly dry. The water and mud slid off of Apollo The water and mud slid off of Apollo's cloak easily, leaving him in much better condition than Toxitus, who was soaked to the bone. As they walked, Talking softly, they became aware of various carcasses of forest animals laying in various states of decay. Stopping to examine a giant boar, they saw what looked like multiple bite marks at different parts of the animal, tearing away to get to the juicier bits like the heart and liver which were missing. Toxitus examined the carcass, then did a quick walk around the area where they found the boar, looking for tracks. Jax saw him tense, clenching his bow in both hands. He laid a hand on Toxitus's shoulder, causing the man to jump. Toxitus stood slowly, eyes never stopping as he looked around them. I just, I, okay, oops. I just, uh, <laughs> I just pressed stop record, as if I was actually narrating a book. Um... Oh, we have more people here. Anybody else who's here, please speak up in the chat. Thanks for coming. Um, glad to see you here. Uh, and if you're new, if you have never been to a Sound Booth Theater Live, please subscribe, uh, like, share the video. If you're enjoying it, that is. Toxitus stood slowly, eyes never stopping as he looked around them. What is it? asked Jax. I'm not sure if Jax is a big, dumb, burly guy, but I'm going to pretend like he is, just for fun. Frank Avila, thanks for coming. Good morning to you, sir. I'm not sure, but I think there is a Hydra somewhere around here, Toxitus said. What is a Hydra? Jax asked. It is bad news. Think of a large, lizard-like body with a long, slender tail barbed at the end. It will have multiple heads, at least two, possibly more. Each head is capable of magic and can spit fire or lightning at, it, at, at its foes. Couple that with spike armor and fearsome teeth and claws. Depending on the size, I do not know if we can defeat it. That sounded bad. There were only two of them, and neither had much protection against magic. Where do you think it is? Jax wondered. He was making progress on his tracking, but Toxitus was a true ma master of the forest. Judging by these tracks, it went that way. Toxitus pointed towards the way that they were already traveling. They tend to stick close to water and are often found inhabiting a, a pond. Or... What do you want to do? asked Jax. He was up for anything and felt confident in his abilities, but he was worried, again, about Toxitus. If Jax died, he'd awaken safe and sound back at the barrel. Toxitus wouldn't. Let's keep going, and keep a sharp eye out. If you hear anything, stop and let's evaluate before doing anything. If it is a large one, we should leave it alone and tell the guard force in the, guard force in the village. Jax agreed, and they continued through the downpour. After a few miles, they heard the sounds of water and paused. Motioning for Jax to stay put, Toxitus glided off through the trees towards the sounds. Jax waited, tucked under his cloak. He tried to remember what he could about hydras. He remembered what Hercules had killed one. He remembered that Hercules had killed one as part of his tasks, and that if you cut off one of the heads, it supposedly grew back two in its place. That probably meant that you had to get to its heart or somewhere vital. A fun we have scaly, fire-breathing heads trying to get to you while you did it. After a, few mo uh, after a few moments, Toxitus came back through the trees, moving quietly. I found it! I found it! He whispered to Jax. It is lounging in a pond up ahead. 
It has just killed some sort of water creature and seems like it is sleeping off its meal. How large is it? Jax asked. It looks like it has two heads and is about the size of a large horse in its body. Wait, wait. That's supposed to be Toxidus again. He just didn't separate the paragraph. It looks like it has two heads and is about the, si the size of a large horse in its body. I can't tell how long the tail is. It is curled up around its body. Level? Twelve. Toxidus looked grim. The creature was three levels above Jack's currently and five above Toxidus. Both had leveled the day before and were making progress today, but they were still outgunned. Toxitus, the man looked at Jax. If we do this, it looks like we're losing. And it looks like we're losing. I want you to leave me behind and get away. I'll make sure it focuses on me if it comes to that. Toxitus started to protest and Jax cut him off. No, if you won't agree to leave me behind, then we won't even try. Remember, I can come back from death. You can't. I won't risk your life. Toxitus studied him and nodded. Thank you for your concern for my life, my friend. I know that to you, you could easily treat me as disposable. The fact that you don't speaks greatly to your character. Jax flashed a grin. I keep telling you that I'm a hero. You just keep forgetting. Toxitus snorted. <laughs> All right, her... <laughs> All right, Heracles, what's the plan? Well, I say the way we've been rolling has worked so far, why not keep it up? Jax asked, Jax asked. So you want to, what did you call it? Tank him? While I damage from afar? Toxitus asked. Do you think you can handle that much damage? Because I'm not sure that I can kill it that quickly before it takes you down. All we can do is try, Jack said. He fixed Toxitus with a look. And remember. I know, I know. If it goes badly, I leave you and run away and meet you back at the village. Toxitus still looked unhappy about it, but he had accepted the conditions that Jax had demanded. All right, let's go. Toxitus, oh. All right, let's go. Toxitus nodded, then moved out, stringing his bow as he went. He circled around to the right, around the edge of the, of the trees next to the pond. He was hoping to find a spot where he could fire from, but had enough cover that he wouldn't be fired by be f fried by the Hydra's breath attack. Jax entered stealth and crept up to the edge of the tree line. He settled down and looked at the, at the Hydra for himself. The beast was lying on the edge of the pond. As Toxitus had said, its body was about the size of a large horse. The dual heads had necks that were about ten feet long, from chest to nose. It had bluish-green scales on the top half of its body, with whiter colors starting about midway up its sides and chest and extending down its belly. The heads were about three feet long, with sleekly raked spikes and small, narrow eye sockets, n small, narrow eye sockets containing green eyes the color of moss. The heads were lying, eyes half open, one on top of another. The top head had its mouth... Thanks, Barry. What's up? What's up, Night Eyes? Good to see you, man. Uh, Jax couldn't see its entire body, only its front half, but the front legs were muscled with small, dense scales flashing pale in the sun. Long, dark claws kneaded the sand in a rhythmic pattern, almost like a cat kneading a knit blanket. Jax squinted, trying to analyze it. Level twelve. Juvenile Hydra was over its head. Jax shook his head. If that was a juvenile, he didn't want to meet an adult until he was a lot stronger. Jax waited until he saw Toxitus settle into place about a quarter of the way around the pond's edge. Toxitus strung an arrow, then gave Jax a nod. Deep breath. In. Out. Ah, <sighs> okay, Jax thought. Let's do this. You're not getting audio? Okay, good. Jax exited at the edge of the wood line at a run, holding his spear in both hands above his head. His strong legs pushed him across the sand quickly and quietly. 
The Hydra, hearing him, raised one head and looked his way quizzingly, wondering what the sound was. Jack saw its eyes widen right before he plunged his spear into the neck of the Hydra. His momentum and strength were, were enough to push the spear all the way through the neck of the Hydra and into its body, pinning the head to its own trunk. I forgot to put up this thingy. Yay! So advance. His momentum and strength were enough to push the spear all the way through the neck of the hydra and into its body, pinning the head on, pinning the head to its own trunk. The pinned head let out a roar of pain and surprise, causing Jax's head to ring with the noise. His momentum, transferred perfectly to the strike, had stopped him on the left side of the hydra, pinning the, pinning the left head in place. The right head, woken by the jostling, whipped around towards Jax, squeezing itself between the ground and the bowed neck of the right head. Jax whipped himself backwards, falling on his ass, with the right head's teeth barely missing him. Jax couldn't believe how fast the beast had reacted. The right head, glaring at him, opened its mouth to hiss at the hydra, got up to hiss as the okay, opened its mouth to hiss as the hydra got up to stand on all four legs. Jax watched the head move back and forth. He nearly missed the danger. Jax! Duck! yelled Toxitus as the Hydra's barbed tail came whistling around at head height. Jax laid bl back flat as the... Blah. What's up, Zior? Good to see you here. Uh, Jax laid back flat as the tail whipped through the space where his body had been, then pushed himself up with his arms and shoulders to flip himself upright. He saw the right head opening its jaws, about to breathe fire or lightning on him, and in desperation he dodged right and ran a few steps out of the line of fire. A blast of lightning hit the earth where he had been standing, blowing a crater two feet in diameter and causing the sand in the middle to melt, glowing. The sound of the blast dwarfed the Hydra's earlier roar. Glancing at the beast, Jax saw some arrows jutting from its torso and the head that was still pinned by Jax's spear. They didn't seem to be slowing it down much, but every little bit helped, Jax figured. He pulled his sword from its scabbard and rushed towards the left side, which Jax figured was the best way to go since the left si side head was still pinned. Whap! Jax cursed to himself. The damn tail! It had come back around and caught him in the back, slamming him forward. He dropped his sword and hit up against the body of the Hydra, which had just stood up to its full height. He lay there a second, against the beast, staring into the eye of the pinned head. It was enraged, glowing moss green and slavering from its jaws as, a, as it bit at the air, straining to get to him. This close, it reminded him of an old move with dot. It reminded him of an old movie with dinosaurs who had been cloned and predictably let loose to attack the humans who had cloned them. Just now, the image of a terrifying head full of sharp teeth and hatred made it all, made it all too real. Jax ducked as the right head came snaking around its body to try to bite him, but its trunk and pinned head were too bulky and it couldn't reach him while he stayed close to it. Unfortunately... The beast realized what was going on and did something Jax didn't foresee. All right, Lau, you're fired. You're fired. You're snoring. You're ruining my stream. Get out. Get out of my house. You're going to stop snoring? Okay. I tried to fire Lau. She wouldn't have it. Oh, cool. Ten, ten people watching now. Thanks for coming, guys. Eleven now. If you're just now getting in, if you just came in like five minutes ago, say hi in the chat, and I'll say hi back. What's up, Danny? Good to see you, man. All right. The right head turned and sank its teeth into the left head, next to where the spear was still pinning it to its body. It began ripping and tearing, biting through the left head's neck. It was trying to bite through the left neck, Jax realized. What's up, Fiji Film? Wolf Runner, good to see you too. 
Laomenides. Laomenides, what the fuck? Why you got why you got to snore while I'm streaming? All right. It began uh, he heard Toxitus screaming, Jax, get out of there! Two new heads will grow! Get out! Jax grabbed his spear and with brute... F I think I, my accent slipped there. Jax grabbed his spear and with the brute strength... Jax grabbed his spear and with brute strength ripped it out of the Hydra's neck, sideways. A huge gout of blood came with it, and with the left head not supported by the spear shaft anymore, the next heave from the right head ripped it right off the, of the body of the Hydra. A great gout of blood came from its neck, and the beast stumbled, falling to its knees. The right head spit out the left, and instead of pain, roared in triumph. It kept its eyes on Jax as it knelt there, waiting for something. <laughs> she is sleepy all the time. Jax, listening to, Tux to Toxitus, was retreating towards the trees when he saw the left head start to shimmer. The bleeding stopped, and rapidly, too rapidly, two heads grew from the base of the old head. The new heads went from being nubs to full size in about twenty seconds. They shook their heads, snapping at one another, until as, as one all three heads turns to look at Jax. Oh, shit. Here we go, thought Jax. He made it to the trees and dodged around the trunk of a large oak, just as two blasts of lightning and one of fire hit the tree and shook it from crown to roots. The explosion caused a cloud of splinters to erupt, but thankfully it was not enough to penetrate to the side where Jax was hiding. The tree, split almost in half and on fire, let out a deep groan that Jax felt in his bones. He felt the ground rising under him and realized that the tree was falling over towards the hydra, lifting the roots and the ground around him, ground around him. He dove forward as the tree fell. A solid oak tree, about eight feet in diameter, it made a surround it made a resound it made a resounding boom as it fell into the pond, causing a small tidal wave. By a stroke of luck, the tree landed on the tail and one back leg of the hydra pinning it in place. Pinning it in place. Jax let out a small prayer to Apollo, as the incredible coincidence seemed like a gift. The Hydra stretched its necks out, straining to get its body to get its body out from under the tree, but it was stuck fast. Toxitus had been steadily firing arrows into the Hydra, and was in a perfect position to fire an arrow at the outstretched middle head of the Hydra. The arrow perfectly placed, struck the hydra in the neck right behind the head, where the jaw hinged into, a, into the skull. That flat, dimpled spot allowed the arrow to penetrate through the entire skull, pinning, to the, head, pinning the head to the tree trunk. Thunk! Another arrow hit the right head, pinning it to the trunk too. The left head, now in a frenzy, was whipping around too quickly for Toxitus to hit it. The two pinned heads, still alive, were blasting non-stop down the length of the trees, blowing branches and pieces of wood all over the place. Jax ran to the right, trying to get out of the line of fire of the two pinned heads. Just then, he saw the left head start to tear into one of the other necks, trying to recreate the earlier way it had created two new necks. I can't let that... I can't let it get that head free, or create two new free heads, Jax thought. Jax charged in from the size. Side, probably. Jax charged in from the side, spear raised up. He heard Toxitus shouting at him as he ran in front of the archer, and thought he heard the word heart as he pounded in towards the Hydra's body. The body was pinned beneath the tree, and Jax almost made it all the way when the last free head saw him and reared up, jaw opening to blast him with its breath weapon blast him with its breath weapon. Jack slammed his spear into the body, arms. Jack slammed it. Jack slammed his spear into the body, arms straining as he pushed with every bit of strength. He felt the jaws of the of the Hydra close around him as the spear slid home, and Jack felt the heartbeat of the Hydra vibrating the shaft of his spear in his hands as it slid into the heart. A moment later, the, ag the agonizing pressure of the jaws released and the light died in the eyes of the last remaining head.
Jax fell to the ground, bleeding. He swiped away all the notifications about his wounds and bleeding status, knowing that soon he would start to heal. He lay there, chest heaving, not really believing that he was still alive. He heard Toxitus as he ran up to where Jax laid. Jax lay, probably is the way to say it. Jax! shouted Tox Toxitus. He pulled the third head off of Jax, and his eyes widened in relief when he saw Jax was still alive. I wasn't sure you survived that. My swat bit you at the end, and then you collapsed. Yeah, well, charging an enraged hydra isn't on my list of things to recommend to people, Jax joked. He ached from head to toe. Oh, I hope there are no more surprises before we get back to town. Toxitus nodded. Same here. We will camp here tonight near the water. The smell of the hydra should keep predators away, and we definitely need to rest and wash off. Wash off. He pulled out his knife. Ever eat hydra steaks before? Ever eat hydra steaks before? Jax laughed. Done. All right, so that is chapter 14 of Olympus Online. Cool little classic battle uh, with a hydra. I thought it was reasonably well written. If any of you guys thought so as well, you uh, you got interested in the story as I got through it, the Kindle version has a link down below in the description. All right, still 10 people watching. Any, if anybody just came in, um, please say hi in the chat again. I'll say hi back. So happy to have you guys here. All right. Let me see what is next is... Rampage by Aaron Oster. Let's see. Where is it? Here we go. Okay, the bit I've included below is from Chapter 9, where the main character, Arbor... Oh, wait, let me uh, change the damn banner. Gotta get used to this. Banners. Rampage by Aaron Oster. You can't, like... You can't really add graphics, I don't think. You can add graphics, but you can't, like, change the size of anything. So. What's up, Neo Tree? Neo Tree? Neo, tr Neo Tree? Neo Tree? All right. Um, so the bit I've included below is from Chapter 9, where the main character, Arbor, visits the city of Grend. He has some dealings with a dwarf merchant and has a run-in with some guards after they, after they accost a gremlin woman, Grack, one of the female characters. Arbor is kind of depressed. His whole family was killed, so don't make him sound too happy. He hates bullies, so the altercation with the guards should... Uh, that sentence ends there. Grack is a gremlin, which in my story are basically red-skinned elves with weird hair and eyes eye color combinations. She has a very light feminine voice and has a bit of a hero worship for Arbor after he saves her. There are some goblin, goblin baddies, but you know how to do douchebag villains, so I'll leave that up to you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. He trusts my douchebag villain judgment. Misspelled Neo as a kid. Now I'm stuck with it. Oh, okay. Uh, um, there's also the dwarf merchant, who you typically do with an Irish accent. Actually, um, Scottish, but yes. Uh, but I'd prefer Southern or Russian if you can manage it. I like the idea of a Russian dwarf. I'll do Russian! All right. So, just so you guys know, uh, Aaron Oster and Sound Booth Theater are in talks about actually producing this audiobook for him. Um, so keep an eye out. Uh, keep an eye out for the release on Amazon on Kindle. Um, I wish I wish he was here. Oh wow, there's 14 people watching now. If uh, if you're just getting in, please say hi in the chat so I can say hi back, so I can recognize you. Um, but yeah, so I think people are pretty excited about this uh, this book from Aaron Oster. Uh, if, if as far as I know, it's classified. As, he says that it's an epic fantasy and cultivation novel so it's not it's not really game lit or lit rpg which is i mean like as much fun as game lit and lit rpg is everybody here at sound Blue theater would 
is is really happy to be working on other stuff you know because that's what we do all the time um we like we like to flex our muscles we like to flex our versatility so um yeah i i don't suspect it'll be too much different uh but you know it won't have the stats and stuff which can get can get kind of old after a while anyway okay so angel gonzalez what's up man thanks for coming man or woman i'm not sure diversity is the spice of life hmm you got adopted and known as the best in the genre now everyone wants you i know i know um it's an it's a very nice problem to have i will say all right so anyone in the audience would you like to uh give me oh by the way uh i got off topic so rampage uh i think i think that annie ellicott is going to be narrating this one uh i'm not going to pretend to imitate annie her voice is far too beautiful for me to be able to actually pull that off um but also this is like a brother sister story so i think mr jtj Justin Thomas James, for those of you who don't know our initials, uh, will be playing the brother and most of the male characters. Um, we'll see. Well, like, this is not official. This is just stuff that uh, Aaron Oster and I are talking about at the moment. So keep an eye out for, for news on this. All right, so anyone in the audience want to give me a fun accent to do as the narrator? Or... You can have me do it as a character that you like from Sound Booth Theater. From some Sound Booth Theater production. Finnish. I don't I can't do Finnish. I don't know a damn thing about the Finnish accent. Lau, why don't you leave? Why don't you make like a tree and go away? She doesn't understand that. Uh she doesn't understand that turn of phrase. News, news, news. Oh my God, that's gonna be so hard. Let me try. I'm gonna try New Zealand. Can I sound like The Rock? Hmm. Let me try. Let me try. Arbor was exhausted. He'd been walking for days, and even his new magic didn't seem to work on sore feet. Not that he even knew what his magic could actually do. His boots were worn out, and his clothes were barely holding up any better. He resolved himself to get new clothing once he reached Grind. Uh, let's see. Need more smolder? How do you do... Can you do smolder in a voice? We'll, we'll try it. All right, so do... I want to try a different... I'm going to do... I think these are younger people. Needs more Calvin. Uh, I think these are younger people. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play Arbor a little, kind of young, like maybe 18. And a horse, definitely a horse. He thought, maybe even two. All around him, black leafless trunks stood, creaking in the light breeze. Stopping for a moment, he pulled his map out once again. According to Silver. He should already have reached Grend, or at least caught sight of it. He put the map back in his bag with a sound of disgust. There was a hill up ahead. There was a hill up ahead. Maybe he'd get a better view from the top. Arbor trudged up the hill, his aching feet crying out in protest. As he crested the hill, his eyes widened, and he gasped audibly. A massive city sprawled out before him, surrounding by a huge stone wall, there was a road down below, and he could see small figures and carts moving along. He could also see an open gate where people and carts were lined up. It seemed that he'd finally reached his destination. With a sigh of relief, he began the long trek down to the road below. It took him the better part of an hour, but he finally reached the road. Upon reaching the road, he realized how tall the walls actually were. Made of massive stone blocks and piled atop one another, the wall stood over fifty feet tall. Walking towards the gate, he was soon forced to stop and wait his turn until a cart in front of him moved on ahead.
What's your business in Grend? Sixteen or fifteen what? It's a fun book. Gary, if you did it as Boxy, you would have to sing. <laughs> Who said Boxy? I, I didn't see a Boxy suggestion. Okay. Arbor looked down in surprise. A short, red-skinned figure dressed in a guard's uniform was looking up at him with a bored expression on his face. The man, or gremlin, Arbor supposed, had deep red skin and short, pointed ears. He had a long, thin nose and a narrow face. His eyes were slanted and had bright yellow irises. Green hair peeked out from under his helmet, and Arbor noticed short claws on the hand that gripped his spear. The guard just sighed, as if he were used to this. First time, first time here, then. What business do you have here? He asked again, he asked again. Arbor had prepared for this adv in advance. Silver had warned him that he'd need a cover story once he reached the city. Mmm, Silver. I'm gonna pretend Silver's a really old person. Better not to let anyone know why you're there, he'd said. When Arbor had asked why, Silver had replied in a tone that suggested he think before he speak. That man Ramson may have friends in the city. Best not to tip him off if he's there. Arbor had felt a little annoyed at Silver's tone of voice, but in the end had decided he was probably correct. I'm a jewel merchant, here to trade my wares, he said smoothly. The guard gave him an appraising look. Arbor was dressed in tattered clothes, and the heavy spike of his sheathed glaive peeked over his shoulder. It's been a long road here, he was quick to explain, and one can't be too careful when carrying valuable merchandise. Apparently, his story wasn't very convincing, because the guard just snorted and shook his head. Though that didn't seem to care, I... though that didn't seem to matter either way, as he launched into what sounded like a well-rehearsed speech. There's an inn, a, there's an inn a bit down the road called the Swan. They have decent rates on rooms and board. The local jeweler is in the market district on the east side of the city. If you are selling jewels, you will have to pay the standard 30% tax on all items sold in the city. 30%? Are you nuts? That's highway robbery! Arbor explained. He couldn't pay 30% of the diamond's value. He needed every copper he could make. It's the standard tax. If you don't like it, you can leave. The guard's eyes narrowed, and his grip tightened on the haft of his spear. No, it's fine, Arbor said quickly, not wanting to cause a scene. Good. The guard, the guard waved him past. And don't go stirring up any trouble. Arbor nodded then headed through the massive open gates, trying not to gawk. It was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. There were people everywhere he looked, and for someone who grew up in a small town, it was a bit overwhelming. The crowd seemed to be a mix of mostly humans and gremlins, but there were a few dwarves mixed in as well. Silver's description of them had been spot on, he noted. He noted. He sounds like William Shatner to you? William Shatner is kind of, kind of got a breathier, broader tone. If you listen to the rock, if you listen to the rock talk, he kind of has that same, that same rhythm to him. Not quite William Shatner. Somewhere around there. The short, bearded man seemed to move the crowd around them as they walked, their broad forms easily standing out from the red-skinned gremlins and the taller humans. He kept walking down the main street until he saw a wooden sign swinging over a door with the word Swan written on it. He was about to go in, when he remembered he had no money, only the jewels he had taken from the blacksmith's shop back home. Make all the gremlins sound like Phil Hartman. Will do. The same smolder. <laughs> oh, 13 watching now. I, I I remember it went down to 10 and back we're up back up to 13. Anyone who's new who just popped in, say hi in the chat and I'll say hi back. So 
So, he walked past the inn and headed for the east side of the city, staring at the tall towers and all the people around him. The buildings ranged in size, from tall, spired buildings to smaller family homes. Everything was made of stone, and Arbor couldn't even imagine the amount of time it must have taken for this all to be built. It took him a little under half an hour, but constantly asking for directions from annoyed passers-by, he finally made it to the trading district. He wandered around a bit, looking at all the stores lining the street and marveling at the variety of different goods being sold. He finally spotted a small sign with the picture of a diamond painted on and guessed that was guessed that that was the jeweler's. He heard a bell tinkle overhead as he walked into the small shop. There was a dwarf behind the counter, looking at a stone through a small eyeglass. He looked up as Arbor walked in and slipped the stone into his pocket. Okay, Russian dwarf, Russian dwarf. How can I help you? He asked. The dwarf had an odd accent that Arbor hadn't heard before. He placed inflections in odd places, so the word you sounded more like ye. Walking up to the counter, he removed the small leather bag from his pocket. I'd like to exchange these for some gold, Arbor said, handing him the bag. The dwarf's eyes bulged as he looked inside. Okay, wait. <laughs> He wants the Russian accent, but he's got all these, but, but he's got Scottishisms. Okay. Uh, lad, uh. Oh, you crazy lad. <laughs> that sounded like Scottish. The dwarf asked. If you go flashing around that much wealth, you'll catch a knife. You'll catch a knife the back. In the back. <laughs> the dwarf was sweating and looked around the empty shop nervously. Are they really worth that much? Arbor asked, more curious than afraid. Uh, I can't even. I'm having a hard time thinking of Russian while I'm thinking of a dwarf at the same time. Yes? He looked around once more, then walked around to the front of the counter. Follow me around back, and we'll get you sorted. Oh, dude. I'm, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with me. Arbor followed the dwarf to a small door on the side of the counter. He had to stoop a bit to enter through the low doorway, but the ceiling was high enough for him to stand once he'd entered. Have a seat, lad. <laughs> the dwarf motioned to a chair by a small table. This might take a few minutes, so best to get comfortable. Comfortable. Arbor nodded his thanks and sank into the chair as the dwarf emptied the small pouch onto the table. There were sixteen gems in all, five blue, six red, four yellow, and one clear. They varied in size, with the yellow being the largest and the clear one the smallest. The dwarf took his looking glass out once again and, muttering to himself, began examining the stones. After a while of looking, Muttering and note-taking, the dwarf looked up. You really do have quite a lot of money here, he said. How much are they worth? Arbor asked with interest. Well, well, the yellow ones are worth roughly fifty gold apiece, the reds are seventy-five, the blues are around two hundred, and the clear one is around three thousand. Arbor had to suppress a shout of glee when the dwarf said that. Back home, the average person only made between 30 and 50 gold a month. The crotchety old blacksmith must have been saving for years to have so much stashed away. He'd never been any good at math, but even he could count these numbers. That was over 4,500 4, gold. He said so out loud, and the dwarf nodded. 4,000. I told you it can't be done without vod vodka. Like Vlad and forget the V. Vlad. So it w Vlad. Okay. Vlad. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Arbor had to suppress a shout of glee when the dwarf said that, 
Back home, the average person only made between 30 and 50 gold a month. The crotchety old blacksmith must have been saving for years to have so much stashed away. He'd never been any good at math, but even he could count these numbers. Okay, sorry. Four thousand six hundred and fifty to be accurate. I can give you a hundred gold in coins. The rest I can give you in trader's notes. What are those? You'd never heard of trader's notes? Trader's notes can be ex... Trader's notes can be exchanged for coin at any... <laughs> ah! Trader's notes can be exchanged for coin at any trading guild or bank owned by the kingdom. I keep wanting to do Scottish. <laughs> I would recommend the guild, though, as their taxes are far less than the king's, the dwarf said with a wink. So do we have a deal? He asked, holding out his hand. Arbor reached out and shook it. The dwarf smiled, then swept the gems back into the bag and placed them in his pocket. He opened a drawer and began counting notes. He placed six notes in front of Arbor. So, uh... These are each worth... These are each worth one thousand. These are each worth... These are each worth one thousand. One thousand, he said, pointing to a four of the larger notes. This one is five hundred and this one is fifty. He pointed to the two smaller notes. Arbor picked them up. They felt odd in his hand, not like paper at all, more like cloth. There was an official-looking seal on all of them, with numbers declaring their value. The dwarf then placed a small sack of glittering coins, containing copper, silver, and gold on the table as well. The way currency worked in Ladron wasn't too complicated. The lowest denomination was the copper coin. There were ten copper to a silver and one hundred silver to a gold. There were also larger gold bars that banks and merchants used, worth anywhere from 100 to 1,000 gold, depending on the weight. Arbor picked up a small sack of coins and tied it to his belt. <laughs> Sinful wound, that is correct. It's more about melody than anything between those two. I... Th I thank you for your business, lad. Now is there anything else I can help you with? With? Now is there anything else I can help you with? Arbor thought on that for a few moments, before nodding. Do you know where I might be able to buy some horses? Arbor now stood inside the stables. The dwarf hadn't just told him where he could buy a horse, but had also told where he could find trail rations and new clothes as well. The stable master was a, was a nice enough man and gave him a fair price on two horses and a full set tack for both. He also showed him how properly saddle and how to properly saddle and care for them after a day's ride. He directed him to where he could buy feed for the horses as well. It took Arbor another hour, but at last he was done with his shopping spree. His coin purse was now 63 gold lighter and 6 silver lighter, but he had, but he had everything he would need for a month-long journey. He also bought a small metal cylinder on a thin chain where he could store his trader's notes. This he slipped over his neck and tucked under his shirt to rest near his other valuables. The light was starting to fade as he headed back to the swan to see if he could still get a room for the night. Still get a room for the night. He was passing a narrow alley when he heard a scream echo from within. He looked around quickly, trying to see if anyone was going to help. He was shocked, though, when everyone just turned the other way, ignoring the obvious sounds of distress. Arbor felt his blood boil as he watched this. How could people so callously ignore someone in need? Quickly dismounting, he tied his two horses to a nearby post, then ran into the alley. The light was noticeably dimmer inside the alley, and it took a few moments for his vision to adjust. What he saw, however, disgusted him even more than the people outside who were ignoring the cries for help. Four male gremlins were standing around a single female gremlin and beating her. The female was on the ground, trying to cover herself as they mercilessly kicked her and pleading for mercy. Her face was tear-streaked, and he could see she wouldn't last much longer. Okay, who was it that you, that you wanted me to play all the gremlins as?
Let's see. Got to look it up. Where is it? Phil Hartman, that's right. Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me. You might remember me. Hmm, let me try and... What am I getting wrong? Here we go. I'm Troy McClure. Here we go. Leave her alone, Arbor shouted, running up and grabbing one of the gremlins by the shoulder. The guard turned around, a sneer coming to face to his face. This is official city business, the gremlin said, pointing to a patch on his chest. Now move along unless you want to get hurt. The other gremlins had stopped beating the girl and were now watching him in obvious interest. You're supposed to be city guards? Arbor asked, appalled. Why were city guards being beating an innocent girl? Arbor didn't care who they were. He couldn't stand bullies. So, drawing his glaive, he took up a fighting stance. I won't ask you again. Leave or die. It's your choice. Look at this. The little shit thinks he can beat us, the ringleader said, drawing a sword from his belt. Let's show him what we do to lawbreakers around here. Arbor took a step back and widened his stance. The alley was narrow, so they would only be able to come at him one or two at a time, though they would still outnumber him. As the first gremlin approached, he quickly stepped forward, thrusting the heavy blade towards his midsection. The blade sunk a few inches into the red creature with a sickening squelch, and he looked at Arbor in shock. Arbor quickly pulled the blade out and spun it, knocking the second gremlin's sword to the side with a loud clang. Bringing the spiked end around in a wide sweep, he cracked him over the head, knocking him to the ground, where he lay dazed. Arbor was shocked that it had worked at all. All that time with Silver and he hadn't managed to hit him once. Now he'd taken down two opponents in a matter of seconds. The other two approached, more wary, now that half their number was down. One tried to get around him, but Arbor shifted his stance and slashed his weapon, intending to take the gremlin's head off. But the nimble bastard jumped back, cursing and narrowly avoiding the, the blow. Arbor sensed it then, the light thrumming in his chest, and he knew what would happen next. They would both rush him at once, thinking to overwhelm him. One would slash at his legs, and the other at his head. It seemed that the gremlins didn't know much about taking on someone with a two-handed weapon, though, as it wasn't a very good plan. They both charged at him and slashed at the same time. Arbor turned his glaive in a half circle and neatly knocked both to the side at once. Then allowing his grip to slide up near the blade, he pulled it back and thrust forward, stabbing one of them through the eye. He pulled the blade free and turned to the last gremlin, who'd already begun stepping back. Looks like all your friends are gone. Care for a fair fight? Arbor growled, taking a step, taking a threatening step forward. The gremlin's eyes widened in terror. Then he dropped his sword and ran from the alley, throwing dire threats over his shoulder. The guards will be here for you soon. You'll be hanged for this. Arbor just sighed and sheathed his weapon. He went over to the gremlin girl and bent down. Later, night eyes. Where'd you go? Okay. It's okay. They're gone. They, weren't hurt. they won't hurt you anymore. My name is Arbor, by the way. What's yours? The girl looked up at him, then he fu- The girl looked up at him then, and he finally got a good look at her face. Arbor was slightly taken aback. She was pretty, in a weird, alien sort of way. She had a lighter red complexion than the gremlins he'd seen so far. Dark blue hair hung to her shoulders and small pointed ears perked up, perked out, peeked out from within. She had bright blue eyes that looked back at him from under slanted brows. She had a small pert nose and full lips colored a darker red than her face. She also had a rather impressive bust figure. Now that she was standing, 
he could see that she was slightly taller than the other gremlins, standing a little under five and a half feet. Thank you for saving me. Her voice was lighter than he'd expected. My name is Grackvine, but you can just call me Grack, she said, wiping her tear-streaked face. She had some visible bruising on her face and arms, and he was sure that her long dress hid further injuries. Can you tell me why you were why they were hurting you? he asked. I didn't have enough money to pay my taxes this month, she said with a sniff. The city guards are awful, constantly raising taxes and claiming them in the, in the name of the king. And when you can't pay them... A loud horn blared, interrupting Grack in the middle of her explanation. Then, and... Then an alarm began ringing from and Gra then an alarm began ringing and Grack's face paled. We need to leave now. We need to leave now. I take it we've been found out. Arbor asked. Grack nodded, then grabbed his hand and ran for the alley entrance. You killed three city guards. They'll hang you for that, and likely me along with you. Well, that's not good. He muttered to himself. Dying wasn't an option right now. At least. Until, not until he managed to save his sister and avenge his family. They came running out of the alley and Armor and Arbor stopped, looking for his horses. Why are you stopping? We need to run, Crack said, pulling his arm. Finally, spotting them, he pulled her towards them. I have horses. Which way is the fastest out of the city? That way. There's a small gate on the south side that might still be open, she said, as the two of them mounted up. The alarm was now ringing louder, and Crack spun her horse to the south gate, kicking it into a gallop. Arbor followed behind her, yelling for people to get out of the way. Men, dwarves, and gremlins alike dove out of the way, cursing, cursing at them as they galloped through the crowded streets. Finally, the gate came into view, but what he saw made his heart skip a beat. They were closing the gate. Arbor spurred his horse faster, kicking its ribs, ribs and shouting. He overtook Grack and bolted towards the gate guards at what was surely a dangerous pace for his horse. He drew his glaive and threw it like a javelin at one of the guards. He was only trying to distract the gremlin, but the blade actually hit him, sinking deep into his shoulder, causing him to spin away from the gate. That was all they needed. The gates stopped closing, and they galloped past the guards, Arbor reaching out as they passed and ripping the glaive free. He heard a scream of pain follow him and did his best to block out the deaths he'd just caused. He heard shouting behind him and looked over his shoulder to see one of the guards shaking their fists at him. Grack pulled up alongside him as they came onto the main road. Why aren't they chasing us? Arbor yelled over to her. They will, but probably not until morning. You guys hear that shit? It sounds like... Oh, it smells like dog in here now, Lau. What have you done? Um... Sounds like a train and a car outside at the same time. My arch nemeses. All right, so that was Rampage, Land of Elements, Land of the Elements, book one by Aaron Oster. If um, if that interested you, keep an eye out for the Kindle release of this book. It should be in the next week or so. Um, and if you want to check out any of any of Aaron Oster's other audiobooks, I've left a link in the description below. Um, they're from, I think, two different series. None of them are narrated by sound booth theater folks, but as if I remember properly, they look like they were done by legit peeps. Let's see here. Um, Doug Tisdale Jr. is fucking super legit, and I have never listened to Mare, Mare Trevathan, so I can't vouch for her, but I know Doug Tisdale's good. So, yeah, go check those out if you, uh, were intrigued by this story. It is song time now, Zior. Um, everybody who's here, thank you so much for watching. I'll be logging off right after this song. Um, so again, remember to like, share, subscribe this video if you had a good time. And um, yeah, check out the links in the description. All right, so I need to pull up the Star Spangled Banner lyrics because I'm... A terrible patriot. I just don't want to fuck it up. It's been so long since I actually read this, or since I actually sang this. And I will be singing as Quantum Hughes. So, let's see. Let's change the banner real quick. Ah, here we go. 
And here goes. Wait, what the fuck? <laughs> the Star Spangled Banner, Super Bowl 25, Whitney Houston? There's like four more, st there's like three more stanzas of lyrics here. I don't know how to sing that stuff, so I'm just going to sing the first stanza. Sorry, guys. By Whitney Houston. Quantum Houston. All right. Here goes, everybody. I know how much you all love America and the federal corporate government. So here goes. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave thank you thank you very much that's america everybody ladies and gentlemen don't forget to visit mc starbucks get yourself a sprinkly asshole drink of some kind and have a good night <laughs>